Be Rad podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's macadamia masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend now available on Amazon. Bala Enzyme, electrolyte and triple enzyme recovery drink mix. Paleo Valley, nutrient-rich ancestral-inspired health products. By Optimizers, performance supplements like magnesium, probiotics, and more. And B-Rad Whey Protein Super Fuel, coming soon. Stay tuned for details. And please visit bradkearns.com to check out my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. And here we go with the show. When we're talking about processed foods, we're uh, really focusing on these, what they call hyper palatable, addictive foods. I think I'm just backing off on the importance of scrutinizing all aspects of my diet. The only time I really have a desire to dine out is when we're talking about uh, unique foods that I'm not necessarily going to be able to replicate at home. I want to tell you about Inside Tracker, an awesome new ultra personalized nutrition and lifestyle program that combines data from your comprehensive blood panels, genetic test results, and lifestyle and fitness data from a Fitbit, for example, and organizes everything into one super cool online portal of your personal health. I am just getting going with this, and it's awesome. It has everything in one spot. For every blood result, you can click on a blog post or watch a video to learn more about these values. It's a great education in general health and self-quantification, and it was developed by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometric data from MIT, Tufts, and Harvard. The patented Inside Tracker algorithm calculates your so called inner age, and it shows each biomarker as either optimized, needs to improve, or at risk. And then you can take precise corrective action with a science backed plan to reach your performance goals. Oh, mercy, people. On my first round of testing, guess what my inner age was? 62! Shocker! Because I just turned 56. I'm sorry. You know what? When I delivered that blood test, I believe I was a little overtired, and several of my biomarkers were deemed to be subpar. So I made some changes as directed. I recovered better, rested, went back, and delivered way better numbers at the next blood test. The Inside Tracker motto is change is an inside job. And that is for real. You got to keep tabs on this stuff to be at your best. And they have an amazing deal just for BRAD podcast listeners. They are going to give away a grand prize of $1,500 in Inside Tracker value. So to enter, all you have to do is go to insidetracker.com slash Brad Pod, B R A D P O D. Check it out right now at the link and enter the contest. Greetings, listeners. I like 2022. How about you? How's it going? Have you? set your New Year's resolutions and put them on paper and going after it. Hmm. I've heard several recent commentators uh, recommending against making New Year's resolutions for various reasons and instead emphasizing uh, taking some time to reflect back on, for example, how the previous year went and looking at some uh, blind spots, areas where you're falling short, things that didn't work out quite like they uh, hope to, instead of once again, perhaps setting yourself up for failure and disappointment with all these big dreams and goals. A lot of times we stumble and struggle uh, because our approach is uh, flawed and uh, destined for for struggle rather than success. So I kind of like that idea since I've faced um, quite a few uh, New Year's myself in my life and was uh, at different times more or less enthused about writing out the goals and uh, getting all pumped up and excited uh, to, to welcome in the new year and attach it to uh, peak performance aspirations. But uh, it takes so much more than um, a big blast of uh, fresh air, hot air at the start of the year to execute. So I'll sprinkle in some of these exciting new ideas that are interesting to me about how to 
uh, progress toward your goals and dreams. So I guess the the essence of the show here is to uh, look here in the new year at some emerging trends, some revisions to conventional popular thinking in the uh, progressive health world. Uh, and I really like how we can maintain that open mind and uh, be willing to revise, adapt, look at new information, and tweak our approach a little bit to uh, pursue continued success, happiness, personal growth. And so I've come up with, uh, let's see, eight different categories that we can talk about here, starting with diet. And oh my gosh, never a dull moment. There's always a war going on somewhere on the globe relating to uh, the the best way to choose your foods for health, uh, sustainability of the planet, uh, dropping excess body fat, all that great stuff. And I think one trend that's emerging, uh, thankfully, is a little bit toning down of the obsessions and the hair-splitting scrutiny of everything that goes into your mouth and the fine-tuning and the optimizing. And pretty soon, a factor of fatigue comes in. Uh, We know about the uh, prevalent condition of orthorexia. That's an unnatural, unhealthy fixation on uh, eating in the most correct manner and how that causes for a, a more stressful lifestyle when you're that worked up about everything that you choose. And so it seems uh, a lot of uh, wonderful leaders are uh, projecting this message of uh, relaxing, toning things down a little bit. And that's not to say uh, lessening your dietary standards. It's absolutely a different concept here. But I think generally the psychic energy that's going out to uh, the intense scrutiny of every single uh, aspect is now getting replaced with maybe a more uh, embraceable and sustainable message of basically cutting out those processed foods with great discipline, uh, enjoying your life and having mealtimes be a centerpiece of that pursuit of uh, help, healthy, happy life. Remember the exchange that Mark Sisson had on the Joe Rogan show where he said, you know, I never put anything into my mouth that I don't absolutely enjoy. And Joe Rogan was talking about his super duper green smoothie that he has every morning. And he says, it tastes disgusting, but it's super healthy. So I drink it down. And Mark's like, not me. Everything I put in my mouth, I absolutely enjoy. So if we can bring enjoying life to the centerpiece and then, hey, if you happen to uh, have an indulgence that's uh, not highly ranked on the nutrient density chart, the Carnivore Scores Food Ranking Chart, which you can download on the homepage of bradkearns.com, where we rank the most nutrient-dense foods on the earth by category. And you can tape that onto your refrigerator and strive to emphasize those foods in your meal planning. Uh, but anyway, when you go off and enjoy yourself, it's an extremely well chosen, exquisitely prepared treat that you enjoy every single bite. That's a huge difference from uh, running down to the convenience store and grabbing a pint of Ben and Jerry's at 10 p.m. versus uh, going to the homemade, handmade ice cream uh, on the streets of Seattle when you're there on vacation. Okay, so the big uh, trend here, trend number one, is toning down on these uh, diet obsessions and the quest for perfection or the over-analytical approach. And instead, looking at that number one category, number one high-priority triage item of ditching processed foods. Uh, with, reference my show with the eminent Dr. Robert Lustig, author of the book Metabolical and many other best-selling books, uh, widely regarded as uh, the world's leading anti-sugar crusader with a lot of research, his life's work in this area. And on my show, he said, if you can simply ditch the nutrient deficient processed foods, which comprise the majority of the calories in the standard American diet, if you can simply eliminate those foods, he contends that it's virtually impossible to increase body fat over time because the natural foods that you consume will contribute to satiety and you'll you won't have a tendency to overeat and head down that spiral downward of uh, becoming uh, metabolically damaged and uh, adding fat uh, year after year over the course of your life you know that disturbing statistic that 
uh, the average American gains 1.5 pounds of fat each year from ages 25 to age 55. And that comes in the form of adding two pounds of excess body fat and losing a half pound of lean muscle mass due to inactivity and so forth. So if we want to uh, steer away from that disastrous accelerated decline into old age, of course, we want to manage our body composition. Probably the best way to determine whether you're maintaining your health status besides getting blood work or in addition to getting blood work is uh, keeping tabs on your body composition, not just your weight on the scale, as I just mentioned, but pursuing the incredibly important goal of maintaining a healthy level of functional uh, lean mass muscle, and then uh, not adding that excess body fat year after year. And so number one objective here is to eliminate processed foods. Number two would probably be to uh, get out there and perform some high intensity exercise. It's now appearing that um, the incredible uh, genetic prompting of being active and pushing it hard once in a while can make a great contribution to um, your body composition. Okay, and so when we're talking about processed foods, we're uh, really focusing on these, what they call hyper palatable, addictive foods. And Dr. Lustig's book goes into great detail here. Rob Wolf's great book, Wired to Eat. Uh, Stefan Guyane's book, The Hungry Brain, and many other books are zeroing in on this concept that when we consume these processed foods, oh boy, are they delicious when they enter our mouth and have that intense uh, taste sensation, but they screw up all kinds of very delicate, uh, genetically wired uh, mechanisms that we have for hunger, satiety, and so forth. Um, for one example, uh, the disruption in leptin signaling that occurs with the consumption of processed foods. And leptin is this very prominent hormone uh, that is responsible for satiety, fat storage, and uh, making the human fit for reproduction, which is our number one genetic drive. And so when we disrupt leptin signaling, we have a tendency to overeat because we're not getting that strong message that we're full and we are uh, well adapted to uh, for reproduction, energy, um, vitality, and so forth. And that comes from these uh, chemically altered foods that are so prominent today. And when your leptin signaling is disrupted, you're going to be locked into this pattern of fat storage and over-consuming calories. So if you're fond of your morning breakfast scone and your evening scoops of ice cream and you have a tendency to indulge over the holidays on the, the cookies and crackers and chips and cakes and all the stuff that we uh, associate with these cultural traditions, what's going to happen is you're going to be more apt to continue to consume these and to want to consume these uh, on a long-term basis. And so this is where uh, we're, we're talking about uh, relaxing from this uh, intense obsession with correct and healthy eating, but there has to be a really disciplined process to eliminate these foods from the diet because of their addictive properties. Um, wheat Belly is another book I'll mention uh, that talks about the addictive properties of wheat and how it's sprinkled into all manner of modern processed foods. So the easy way to do it is to uh, emphasize the most wholesome and natural foods and especially uh, the nutrient dense foods where if you sit down and have a delicious omelet or have uh, your favorite uh, steak and vegetables for dinner, you are going to have the, a beautiful sensation of satiety uh, that does not compare when you're snacking on potato chips uh, throughout the afternoon. All right. And personally, I'm embracing this uh, trend here. Uh, and I've uh, possibly due to fatigue from years and years of being deep into this and having this be my life's work. I'm no longer uh, really concerned about my macronutrient ratios or my uh, caloric intake. Um, I don't really mind um, if I'm dipping into a popcorn binge here and there. I have my Fatty Popcorn Boy Saga uh, show archived for all eternity on the podcast channel if you want to hear what happens when you go overboard. Uh, but right now, I've done the hard work to uh, attain my ideal body composition as I detailed at the other show. And so um, I think I'm just backing off on the importance of scrutinizing all aspects of my diet. That includes 
That includes things like monitoring my blood glucose. I had some wonderful stints with the continuous glucose monitor. And then after a while, I realized that there wasn't much drama there, right? The um, the curve was pretty awesome. Uh, the standard deviation was very low. In other words, I was always in a tight range with my blood sugar, even after meals. And that was because my meals are uh, full of uh, nutrient-dense foods and devoid of the nutrient-deficient processed foods. So I'm kind of on track here. And my main concern with my diet is to uh, enhance, maximize the nutrient density. And that's really uh, driven by the interest in peak performance, athletic performance, recovery, all that great stuff. Uh, The desire to maintain a healthy body composition rather than uh, tiptoe over into those slippery slopes that can happen when uh, things like ice cream and uh, uh, excess popcorn habit is lingering around, right? And that's the slippery slope we're talking about is just ditching those processed foods and then allowing yourself to uh, enjoy your meals and make your choices based on uh, personal preference within the categories of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. Okay, uh, so just to uh, reiterate again, that uh, means a extremely low tolerance for anything that could be considered junk food. I just won't eat anything that's not, um, uh, you know, an exquisite indulgence or is extremely healthy. And I'll take any opportunity that I need to, uh, to fast and skip a meal if I'm not presented with incredibly healthy options. And I have trended toward, I think, thanks to, um, Uh, quarantine also toward um, eating the vast majority of my meals at home. It's because I can pretty much kick butt on almost every restaurant when it comes to uh, preparing a a cleanly sourced food and nutrient dense meal. So the only time I'm really have a desire to dine out is when we're talking about uh, unique foods that I'm not necessarily going to be able to replicate at home. Uh, That would be Thai, that would be Japanese um, maybe the Mexican carnicerias where they're serving a lot of organ meats. And boy, is that fun to go out and get uh, some great food like that. But I'm not too excited to order a $32 steak when I can uh, make my butcher box steak at home and uh, have confident that it's the highest quality sourced grass fed beef and I can eat as much as I want. And it's great. So uh, focus on a diet of maximum nutrient density. I strongly urge you to download our chart that we work so hard on called the Carnivore Scores Food Rankings Chart. It's a really nice visual to see that uh, the pastured eggs and the grass-fed beef and, of course, the organ meats, if you can have those, find a way to sprinkle those into your diet. I'm doing great with my morning smoothie because I have a nice, appropriate serving of organ meats every single day. And um, I don't have to worry about cooking them. Um, I'm putting all kinds of other things into the smoothie uh, in the interest of nutrient density. And it's enjoyable. It tastes good. And I got that uh, extra protein in the diet. And that's working really well for me. I'll talk more about that shortly. Um, Back to Dr. Herman Ponser and the shows I did with him and his commentary on diet. Uh, He said, the secret here is to find a diet that's psychologically pleasing and does not result in the consumption of excess calories. And that transitions us right into number two uh, and the emerging concepts about reducing excess body fat. It seems like we are kind of going full circle here and back to uh, the um, admission that it kind of is all about the calories that you consume versus the calories that you burn. And I think when we got in the height of the keto craze, uh, there was some notion that um, we could kind of fool that Uh, bottom line insight that it's about calories and it's about eating less food to drop excess body fat. People that took it to the extreme on the bacon and butter trend are walking around all day uh, throwing fat down uh, with little keto approved snacks that you find in a bag now at a big box store or a health food store and thinking that they could somehow Um, drop excess body fat as long as they kept their carbohydrate count down in the keto guidelines of 50 grams per day or less and realizing that uh, you can definitely eat your way into uh, body fat uh, stall uh, by consuming all your fat calories from fat rather than burning it off your body which is the 
um, intended goal uh, for most people who are immersed into ketogenic diet plan. Um, Lane Norton, kind of a controversial, opinionated guy that you can hear on numerous podcasts. Uh, he's a PhD. He's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He's a competitive bodybuilder. And you got to give a nod to the bodybuilding community because they know how to cut up and get ripped. So uh, a lot of people take a second look. Uh, maybe they're not... Um, as, as impressed as they as they might be with the uh, incredible shredded muscles uh, and all the ridiculous stuff that they do, let's put that aside for a moment where they're dehydrating themselves and getting that uh, extreme look when they go up on stage. But in general, the bodybuilder who's gone so deep in you know to the edge of human performance in this area, they know how to get fat off their body. So we can take some insights from that scene and uh, apply them in a reasonable manner uh, rather than if you're not interested in the ridiculousness and the extreme nature of bodybuilders, they do know how to uh, get that fat off the body. Now, they are typically taking so much fat off the body that they're immersed into a world of uh, psychological pain and suffering from denying themselves every day, and it's highly unsustainable. And we know that there's a lot of rebound effect where they go in their contest, they take their pictures, and then they put on an extra 10 or 20 pounds. So if you can relate in any way, maybe you've been down that road where you went too extreme, you push yourself too hard, and you have that rebound and those compensatory effects, um, that's probably something that's uh, undesirable to just about everybody. I don't know who would want to yo-yo that bad, uh, but to kind of take the inspiration of, you know, tightening up your caloric intake in order to uh, look better, feel better, and reach that goal that's been lingering there in a frustrating manner and hasn't been able to be achieved. It's that simple. And back to Ponser and his commentary about every diet is essentially a gimmick. And uh, by and large, they work because they uh, have some form of restriction involved, boy, you can kind of um, plug that in in any way you want. If you want to set the rule that you're not going to consume any calories till 12 noon, you're going to eat in that 16-8 pattern. Realize that um, it's not the uh, logistics there. It's just the spirit of your uh, approach that's going to work. Same with ketogenic diet where you're uh, cutting out carbs and limiting them to 50 grams a day. That will work very effectively, probably more effectively than anything that we've seen, um, because it'll also regulate um, your blood glucose and insulin uh, better than some other diets. Uh, however, it's not anything magic. And um, I think it was on Ponser's show where he mentioned uh, the Twinkie diet. You can probably, we'll, we'll find a link in the show notes, uh, but some scientific-minded guy went on this Twinkie diet where all he ate was Twinkies, and sure enough, he lost um, a, a substantial amount of excess body fat because he consumed fewer Twinkie calories than he burned. Um, not that that's uh, recommended, but uh, taking that insight and remembering that, um, we can kind of be uh, a little more customized and sustainable with our approach to dropping excess body fat and having a diet of maximum enjoyment and maximum nutrient density. And I'm really in favor of the uh, intuitive approach where you don't have to uh, lock into any regimented uh, magical process, but instead just set the intention that it's time to uh, clean up your diet, uh, make better choices, um, cut back on the extra caloric intake, do something else instead, you know, stay more active, whatever it is. And um, that includes uh, what's effective for me is to experience hunger once in a while. So you enhance your appreciation of nutrient dense, enjoyable, delicious meals. Um, so that could be skipping meals, that could be uh, just not over consuming, being more mindful and intentional when you sit down to a meal, maybe have the TV off, maybe you're not even reading the newspaper or, or listening, you're just enjoying conversation and enjoying the food and taking your bites more slowly, perhaps honoring the Japanese tradition of hara hachi banme. Hara hachi ban me, which translates to uh, finishing eating when you're 80% full rather than 100% full. So all those things will work really effectively. 
And I want to add my personal insight here because um, we heard Dr. Ponser talk about how human calorie burning is constrained and his great work with the Hadza, uh, essentially suggesting that um, we burn around the same number of calories per day, regardless of whether we exercise or not. So we want to put the focus on caloric intake more so than this uh, longtime obsession with burning calories uh, in the interest of fat reduction. We know that that has a lot of difficulties and challenges with it because our body engages in uh, compensatory strategies to uh, balance out caloric expenditure if we happen to uh, burn a ton of calories uh, in a fervent uh, workout pattern. Um, I think it was Chris Kelly on my show uh, uttered the quote that um, reproduction, repair, growth, and locomotion are a zero-sum game for the human. In other words, locomotion, that would be the term for exercise or working hard all day out there in a manual labor job, whatever it is. So if you're doing a lot of locomotion or you're doing excess locomotion, too much exercise, you're going to tone down those other critical uh, human functions, reproduction, repair, and growth. So you're going to have... Uh, you're going to feel lazier throughout the day if you're over-exercising. Your immune system is going to be suppressed. And in the extreme uh, examples, such as the uh, very low body fat elite female athletes, they experience uh, amenorrhea, the cessation of uh, menstruation, because their body is not no longer fit for reproduction uh, because of their extreme exercise patterns. So um, that means that you don't have to obsess on workout caloric expenditure, but rather uh, be more balanced and more mindful with your dietary habits. And that is kind of the latest, greatest thinking about fat reduction. Hey, listeners, I discovered an awesome new electrolyte and triple enzyme powdered drink that's going to knock your socks off. It's called Bala Enzyme. And it comes in a convenient little pouch of bright orange powder that you pour into water for the ultimate electrolyte and antioxidant drink. It's simple, convenient, and yes, the orange tint comes from a potent serving of turmeric along with a clean and diverse assortment of enzymes and electrolytes and a perfect taste that's not fake or too sweet. Bala was created by husband and wife doctors to help their patients recover from inflammation, improve hydration, speed up recovery, even relieve joint pain, improve digestion, and boost immunity. I love their incredible devotion to product quality. There's a lot of research behind it. And I just sprinkle this packet into ice water, and it's so easy to stay hydrated because you absolutely enjoy the taste of the drink. Get their convenient little packets. They even designed it with the uh, the tear half torn so it's easy to open into the water. I love what they think of. And it comes in three exciting flavors, pineapple, lime, and berry. It's so potent, it might stain your fingers if you get it on your fingers. And yes, that's a good thing for a serving of turmeric that's that potent. It's also sugar-free, zero-carb, and promoting of the three R's. Rehydrate, relieve, and revive. Please visit balaenzyme.com, B-A-L-A-E-N-Z-Y-M-E. And of course, there's a special deal for BRAD Podcast listeners. 30% off your first order. Just use the code BRAD30 at balaenzyme.com. I do want to put in my personal insight that high-intensity exercise does make a huge difference in your goals of reducing excess body fat. I'm not sure how this would stand up to scientific scrutiny. I hit Dr. Ponser with some of this stuff uh, in our interview, uh, but it, there's so much anecdotal evidence that if you become competent at high impact, especially high impact sprinting, jumping, and really pushing your body to the limit once in a while with these super challenging uh, exercises. John Jaquis talks about that a lot in his book, uh, Weight Training is a Waste of Time, how the X3 bar can bring your muscles to complete uh, failure and very rapid glycogen depletion in the muscle. Uh, you are sending profound genetic signals to drop excess body fat with uh, all, all of the things uh, uh, put aside for a moment uh, in terms of your, uh, let's say, total daily caloric expenditure. So we have compensatory mechanisms where if we over-exercise, we're going to tone down our calorie burning. 
And then we have this other dimension where if you are an active, explosive human putting out、uh, wonderful energy during these workouts, you are going to have some prompts in place to drop excess body fat. And、uh, the experts are not sure whether、uh, these extreme workouts help to、um, regulate your appetite. I don't think that's true. I think I will. Tend to eat more calories on the days、uh, that I've conducted a high intensity sprinting or jumping workout.、Uh, but if you just want to isolate on、uh, the genetic signaling for、uh, adapting to workout stimulus, when you are running sprints, especially high impact sprints on flat ground, the penalty for carrying excess body fat is so severe that your body is going to adapt to that workout stimulus by reducing excess body fat to make you more fit for. Uh, future endeavors, jumping into the air, sprinting, and so forth. Okay, so that is、um, number two,、uh, reducing excess body fat. Number one was、uh, toning down the diet obsessions. And then,、uh, relatedly, in the、um, diet category, is、um, backing off of this,、uh, these admonitions. That、uh, fasting is、uh, absolutely essential for health, carb restriction is essential for health, and protein restriction is essential for health. And we've heard a lot about the dangers of consuming excess protein、uh, in recent years. And the commentary goes somewhat like this、uh, they talk about a, a chronic. Uh, chronically excessive protein intake will overstimulate these growth pathways、uh, known as mTOR and IGF 1.、Uh, these are hormones that、uh, trigger accelerated cell division, which is how you get bigger muscles, for example. And、um, excess insulin being a sort of、uh, having a,、um, an anabolic effect on the body to build muscle and so forth. And so、uh, the thinking is if you're constantly locked into these、um, uh, growth patterns, you will experience accelerated cell division and possibly unregulated cell division, which is the essence of how cancer gets started, right? Cells that divide inappropriately and become cancerous. And accelerated cell division, like you would see in someone who's a bodybuilder trying to get bigger and bigger, bigger muscles, or the kid who's trying to make the high school football team and put on weight and, and、uh, eating calories and working out all day long. These are kind of the opposite of the essence of longevity, which is enhanced、uh, cellular repair and prolonging the lifespan of the cells. The cells can only divide. A certain number of times, a finite number of times, and then、uh, they die. And that's why we talk about telomere length as this marker of longevity. The telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter over your lifetime. And then pretty soon, when the, pretty soon when the cells、um, can't divide anymore,、um, that's when you go into、um, demise. Okay, so this、uh, unregulated cell division is undesirable in general over your lifespan,、uh, except those.、Uh, Distinct times of life where you are uh, desiring uh, cell growth and、uh, accelerated cell division. So that would be during、um, infancy and adolescence, right? You want to grow to your full size. You're not worried about、um, restricting calories or any of that nonsense.、Um, same with the athlete looking to、uh, increase muscle mass or、uh, a pregnant nursing mother who's trying to provide for the baby's needs. We're not. Uh, not a great time to、uh, go on a diet and go on extended fasting periods, okay? So we, we take this insight and run with it, and it gets misinterpreted, and we put a blanket statement over、um, something in an inappropriate manner. So we definitely don't want to be locked into accelerated cell division patterns over the course of our life. But we do want to be healthy and strong and vital throughout life and、uh, ask a lot of our bodies so that we don't go into、uh, demise caused by、uh, sedentary patterns, loss of muscle mass, loss of energy, loss of performance. So, what we're really looking at here is a feast or famine pattern that's been talked about so long. Dr. Art Devaney, I think, was credited with first uttering that concept many years ago. And there's times when、um, you definitely、uh, don't mind、uh, consuming appropriate calories, stimulating those growth pathways, mTOR, IGF 1, because that's how your muscles recover from stress and grow strong and stay strong. Uh, but of course,、uh, overdoing it is a whole different story. And I think the research. 
that's uh, talking about um, having too much protein and, and um, uh, shortening your lifespan accordingly is probably looking at uh, people who are inactive and eat three meals a day, uh, never bother to challenge their energy systems, energy expenditure, and then, of course, all kinds of bad things happen when you consume too many uh, carbohydrates, especially, and overburden the insulin system, probably consuming uh, plenty of protein and never having those um, those cycles where you've burned up a lot of energy, you need to recover, you need to consume fuel, you're just uh, kind of an overfed, inactive human, and you're going to get cancer and you're going to be a statistic. So let's take everything in the proper perspective and realize that feast or famine is the most desirable uh, way to go through life. That's our genetic experience. That's what our genes expect, right? That's how uh, human evolution occurred, is we had to suffer and endure through these cycles. We had to work hard with no promise of calories at the end of the rainbow and then adjust accordingly. And then when we uh, did bring down the woolly mammoth, uh, we ate like kings for uh, six weeks straight, and then we uh, faced a uh, long, difficult winter where we were tapping into all these wonderful mechanisms that are talked about so glowingly, like extended fasting, um, restricting carbs, and making ketones, and having the wonderful anti-inflammatory and cognitive benefits of uh, being in ketosis. But everything is in a nice, fluid, big-picture perspective here, so we don't want to uh, pull insights out of the hat in the wrong context and get scared of uh, making a devoted effort to um, consume sufficient protein and perhaps going into that goal of consuming uh, extra protein for a variety of reasons. One of them is um, we become uh, less efficient at protein synthesis as we age. Another one is if we are leading a healthy, active, fit lifestyle, we want to definitely ensure that we can optimize protein synthesis in order to recover from uh, the wonderful activities that we're putting our body through. Uh, that's why I'm so excited about my protein supplement super fuel that I'm coming out with shortly. You're going to hear all about that. Uh, but I've been doing this morning protein smoothie, and it's kind of the centerpiece of my diet. It ensures that I get uh, this incredible nutrient density, especially when I'm throwing in uh, the organ meats and the creatine and the other things uh, in one shot. I'm throwing all my pills in there too, because I'm not that good at pill popping. I kind of get lazy. I see them sitting on my shelf. Uh, but when you can throw 24 capsules into the blender and then just drink it down, it's pretty automatic. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons to be excited about putting protein at the centerpiece of your diet and not uh, buying into uh, this distorted concept that you're risking your life by having a, a protein-centric diet. Um, we've been told some strange things like uh, excess protein converts into glucose. And so then you're going to get fat from eating too much protein, right? Because the glucose will then be converted into fat. Uh, this has been uh, corrected most notably by Dr. Kate Shanahan, who asserts that, uh, guess what? The body doesn't ever make extra of anything. This goes against basic human physiology and the laws of nature. So, um, if you need glucose, uh, you will engage in gluconeogenesis to convert uh, either lean muscle mass or ingested protein into glucose for immediate energy needs as part of the fight or flight response. Uh, if you don't need extra glucose, there is no way your body is ever going to make extra glucose for no reason. If you uh, jam it down your throat with your Starbucks drink, that's a different story. Now your body has to deal with excess glucose that's been ingested. Uh, but our beautiful, delicate internal mechanisms will ensure that we make um, just the amount of ketones that we need. That's why uh, when you first go into a uh, ketogenic diet, you're going to have these super high readings um, in your uh, urine strips or even in your blood. And then you're going to regulate when your body starts to learn exactly amount, the amount of ketones that you need. It doesn't have to go excre excreting a ton of it and everything's going to optimize naturally. And that also goes for um, when you consume, let's say you were to try to consume excess protein, um, guess what's going to happen? First of all, you're going to optimize all your um, protein synthesis uh, pathways, and then um, <laughs> you're going to be really full. 
And so it's going to be really, really difficult to overdo it. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever had that sensation of consuming too many steaks for dinner or, oh, gee, I feel terrible. I had too many eggs for breakfast. We have those built-in satiety factors that kind of keep us optimized when it comes to uh, protein consumption. Yeah, the body will also excrete excess protein. Um, we have heard that this can be stressful to the kidneys, and I've heard really smart guys like Rob Wolf say there's absolutely uh, little or no research uh, to say that this is accurate. It's just one of those things that's been floated out there and you might have heard about. And closing this section up, speaking of Rob Wolf, his epic quote that he uttered on my podcast, if you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein, end quote. Love that. And that brings us to the fourth item on the list. And this will close part one. Part two, we're going to get into the exercise trends, focus on that. But I'll throw in this uh, emerging trend, and that is um, digital regulation, digital minimalism, uh, improving our focus, taking downtime, and engaging in self-reflection. All these things that we've forgotten about as we've been swept up in the early years of the digital age, right? We're forced to make massive adjustment on how we've lived our lives. Uh, for those of us in the relevant age groups, we can uh, have some good reference points of the decades before uh, mobile technology, the decades before the internet, and how life was so different and how we'd sit down with a book and spend an afternoon reading a book. And I can't remember the last time I did that. I, I feel like it's um, that there's a void because of the, uh, the tornado of the digital experience and the nonstop digital stimulation. And so uh, now that we are striving to live a life of balance and, and grace and stress management, uh, we're forced to uh, kind of uh, stare in the mirror and say, gee, um, is my mobile device uh, running my life? Are there some uh, safeguards and strategies I can put into place to make sure that um, the device is working for me rather than uh, working me over, right? Um, I've heard some interesting folks recently on podcasts. One of them is the author Greg Grek. He wrote a book called Nikon. That's a Japanese word. Sounds like the camera, but it's spelled N-A-I-K-A-N. The book is called Nikon, Attitude, Grace, and the Japanese Art of Self-Reflection. And Nikon is a structured method for meditating about our lives, our interconnections, and our missteps. And uh, Doc, uh, Grek contends that um, Interestingly, throughout the day, we're either in uh, this production mode, this work mode where we're accomplishing things, or we're in the zone out mode when we're tired and uh, have accomplished a bunch of things throughout the day. Then we sit down and engage in passive entertainment. We're watching our, our, our shows on streaming media. And what's missing is that uh, number three, which would be uh, described, he describes as self-reflection mode. Right, the daydreaming, the, the the lost art of just uh, sitting on the front porch, and nope, you're not producing, you're not you're not cranking through your to do list, nor are you passively engaging in digital entertainment. You're just reflecting, and he makes a strong recommendation to spend more time in that self reflection mode. Um, that's when insights come into play or, you know, you, you develop a healthy, fresh perspective about where you're headed in your life and uh, the meaning of all the things that you're doing as you jam, jam, jam through your busy day. And of course, when we're engaged with a mobile device and in that uh, zone out, that entertainment, passive entertainment mode, that's not happening either because our attention is grabbed by uh, the exciting program and you have every right to unwind after a busy day. But if we're looking at uh, a wall on off switch, um, this is not how the human is built. We have more facets to that. So we can have a three way switch, right? And uh, put, put in a vote here for um, self reflection. And I think what's happening today is we have an urgent need to create uh, opportunities where we can succeed here, create situations where we are deliberately disengaged from mobile technology, uh, hyper-connectivity, hyper-stimulation. That's why I'm so fond of my morning routine. 
Um, I talk about the meditative aspects of going through the motions uh, and counting all the sequences that I perform. Uh, but I also have to admit, um, being honest here, that uh, it's difficult to motivate every single day. So sometimes I put in uh, the earbuds and I'll listen to a podcast or an audio book, and that'll make it uh, a little more enjoyable or easier to go and uh, complete my, my sequences. But I notice that I'm always striving for balance here. So maybe the next day or maybe part of the routine is just that uh, mindful uh, experience where I'm, I'm sitting there without any outside stimulation and just counting my, my leg exercises. Uh, but I am uh, leaking a little bit there and that's okay too. I get a lot of pleasure and enjoyment and I have a lot of uh, ambition to listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, but we're kind of trying to strive for balance at all times. And I think getting out into nature is a wonderful way uh, to kind of enforce um, a, a disconnection, right? for situations where we're just uh, having to be alone with our thoughts or what have you. Uh, another uh, book uh, called Monotasking, or no, it's called The 12 Monotasks, uh, written by Thatcher Wine. Uh, he gave some great comments uh, also that uh, this is a lost art that we have to reclaim. So we have to become good at monotasking by picking things like reading a book is a great example of a monotask because um, you're not going to be able to watch a TV program and read a book. Um, and so you're kind of uh, devoted to the page and you're in that world that used to be so familiar to us before the digital age. Uh, and that's a great way to kind of uh, build your monotasking muscles. Same with listening is on the list. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and um, boy, half listening, we're getting really good at that skill these days where uh, there's a device in your hand, you're glancing at your text message while someone's talking too long or telling a story and our attention span, um, I, I believe... Uh, Thatcher Wine on, on his podcast said that um, there's some research showing that our average attention span is like eight seconds or something ridiculous like that. And then we start to lose it a little bit. <laughs> so um, if you can actually be an intent listener in a conversation with another human, that is also building your monotasking muscles. And so creating these situations where you purposefully monotask um, is a way to kind of regain what we are losing with uh, digital stimulation. Driving, I believe, is another example that he referenced or I just thought of because um, driving is an opportunity to, for me anyway, it's like, listen to podcasts, make phone calls. <laughs> I'm not going to sit and look out the window and, and, and keep my car straight in the lane. It's too easy. Come on, there's uh, time to be more productive. But if you want to take, you know, 20 minutes of your hour drive and just sit there in self-reflection, it might be a really good time because uh, as Dr. Bruce Lipton said on his show, um, driving is an automatic behavior. It's a subconscious behavior. Okay, how does that sound? Uh, give it a shot and start with something that's simple, easy, and doable. You don't have to, um, you know, put your phone down the entire day and walk around uh, frustrated and bored. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're up for it, why don't you take five or 10 minutes and walk around the block, leash up the dog, uh, don't bring any devices and just kind of soak in the surroundings and come back and feel refreshed and energized. It's especially a good idea in between taking breaks between uh, challenging cognitive tasks because you will come back refreshed and energized. And we know from brain research that you are physically and, and mentally incapable of sitting down at a screen and being in peak cognitive mode for eight hours straight over the course of the day, that the brain can really only intensely concentrate for about 20 minutes before it requires a brief break. And if you've been going strong for an hour, uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, Huberman Lab podcast, talks about these 90-minute blocks that he strives for, and he strives to bank two of those per day where he's in uh, incredibly intense peak cognitive performance mode with no distractions. And if he can uh, do that twice a day, that's pretty much the maximum capability of even a very highly productive person. And so if you think about it that way, and you uh, set a goal of going into this um, deep, co deep, deep cognitive performance mode for 90 minutes, then get up, walk around the block, uh, go do a workout, do something where uh, you're disengaged from, you know, this intense concentration and this hyper connectivity, and then you return refreshed and energized. Okay, we have a nice little package there of emerging themes, trends, revisions, progressions. And uh, just to summarize, the first one was uh, the 
uh, the diet obsessions and the hair splitting scrutiny we're kind of uh, zooming out now and thinking about it in terms of just uh, cutting out junk food uh, second is uh, dropping excess body fat uh, putting down a lot of the gimmickry and the games and realizing that it's back to uh, the simplicity of eating fewer calories and um, getting that excess fat off your body once and for all and uh, number three is backing off from these dire warnings that uh, carbs are universally bad uh, because the keto craze is all about cutting back on carbs, uh, that consuming too much protein is going to shorten your lifespan and give you cancer. And even about the need to be devoted to fasting, intermittent fasting, they call it, uh, as the, uh, the, the exalted path to health. And that can work for many people, especially those uh, with metabolic damage who are trying to turn things around and uh, drop excess body fat, get out of the risk category. Uh, but it's uh, balanced, counterbalanced uh, in, in one sentence by Rob Wolf saying, if you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein. And there's um, a really good vote here for this feast or famine strategy where you have an intuitive approach. Um, you're not worried. You're not overly stressed about uh, consuming calories when you want them. You make sure you're active. You make sure you're giving um, some uh, a brief high intensity output on a regular basis and going with the flow, focusing on nutrient dense meals. And um, finally, we uh, shifted gears away from diet and talking about um, this need, this desperate need to uh, take control over the uh, the digital world, the, the hyper connectivity, uh, the mobile device, and create a life that's uh, in good balance where you're uh, throwing in not only uh, this incredible productivity that we're capable of these days, um, and of course, we're allowed to have our uh, entertainment consumption, uh, but that door number three of self-reflection time and, and um, taking some time with your own thoughts and learning, uh, reclaiming the lost art of monotasking. Thank you so much for listening. What do you think? Uh, be part of the conversation. Send us an email, podcast at bradventures.com. Love to hear from you. And I always appreciate you spreading the word about the show, about our sponsors, get people connected, send them over to my website, tell them to register for the email. They'll get a bunch of free ebooks on fun and interesting topics, and we can carry on with our quest to live a healthy, happy, lengthy, balanced life. Thank you so much for listening. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, listeners, I want to tell you about an interesting product from Paleo Valley, apple cider vinegar capsules. This product allows you to enjoy all the healing properties of apple cider vinegar in your daily diet without the hassle or the burning that comes when you try to swallow it directly. And the healing properties are many. They're well validated. You've probably heard how apple cider vinegar helps with blood glucose control, breaking down amino acids for better absorption, and general digestive health and nutrient assimilation. The Paleo Valley Apple Cider Vinegar Complex adds other healing spices like turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, and lemon for more digestive health. As a whole, this formulation has a lot of research-backed validation that you'll improve blood pressure, cardiovascular health, and disease prevention, and profound benefits for insulin sensitivity, satiety and hunger management, glucose regulation, and fat metabolism. The apple cider vinegar complex is a great idea to take when you're traveling and eating different foods, giving your digestive system the boost it needs. Everything in the bottle is organic, and the formula has been carefully fermented into potent acetic acid, which confers the aforementioned health benefits. Why don't you try some? Go to paleovalley.com and take that 15% discount with the code BRAD15. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkearns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. 
And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.